Good afternoon, and welcome to the Beyond Meat 2023 fourth quarter conference call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note, this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Paul Shepard, Vice President, FP&A and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. Joining me on today's call are Ethan Brown, Founder, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Luby Couture, Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer. By now, everyone should have access to the company's fourth quarter and full year 2023 earnings press release filed today after market close. This document is available in the Investor Relations section of Beyond Meat's website at www.beyondmeat.com. Before we begin, please note that all the information presented on today's call is unaudited and that during the course of this call, management may make forward-looking statements within the meaning of the federal securities laws. These statements are based on management's current expectations and beliefs and involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results that differ materially from those described in these forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements in today's earnings release, along with the comments on this call, are made only as of today and will not be updated as actual events unfold. We refer you to today's press release, company's quarterly report on Form 10-Q for the quarter ended September 30th, 2023, and to the company's annual report on Form 10-K for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2023, to be filed with the SEC, along with other filings with the SEC, for a detailed discussion of the risks that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied in any forward-looking statements made today. Please also note that on today's call, management may reference adjusted EBITDA, which is a non-GAAP financial measure. While we believe this non-GAAP financial measure provides useful information for investors, any reference to this information is not intended to be considered in isolation or as a substitute for the financial information presented in accordance with GAAP. Please refer to today's press release for a reconciliation of adjusted EBITDA to its most comparable GAAP measure. And with that, I would now like to turn the call over to Ethan Brown. Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. I will begin my comments by briefly reviewing the five priorities we anchored our activities around in Q4 2023, and then turn to our five forward priorities for 2024. In both instances, these steps are intended to serve and accelerate our progress towards sustainable operations and a return to growth. In Q4 2023, we executed across the following actions. One, we sought to accelerate our transition to a leaner operating structure. As part of these efforts, we established a minimum of 70 million in cuts from our operating budget for 2024. We recorded approximately 95.6 in non-cash charges, primarily relating to inventory and assets now deemed to be in excess or no longer consistent with our path to profitability, and continued to consolidate our production footprint. Two, in U.S. retail, we put the finishing touches on a multi-year renovation of certain core platforms, including Beyond Burger and Beyond Beef. We believe this renovation further positions the brand to overcome misinformation regarding the nutritional and health profile of our products while providing strong support for certain pricing actions. Three, we conducted extensive pricing analysis and as discussed momentarily, are now preparing to implement pricing changes to support gross margin expansion. Four, throughout the quarter, we continue to use inventory management to free up working capital. Five, we maintained our investment focus in Europe and served our strategic customers in this important market for plant-based meats, including continued traction in McDonald's across countries such as Austria, Germany, Ireland, the Netherlands, UK, Malta, Portugal, Slovenia, and Switzerland. Turning to 2024, a pivotal year for Beyond Meat, we are pursuing the following five priorities 
several of which simply represent a transition from 2023 planning to 2024 implementation. One, we are beginning 2024 by executing within a leaner operation consistent with substantially reduced 2024 planned OPEX and cash use. Part and parcel with this leaner operation is our ongoing tightening of focus relating to portfolio, markets, and consumer. We are, as just one example, discontinuing our Beyond Meat Jerky product line, despite its number one position in the plant-based jerky category. These refinements allow focus and resources to be put against our latest product platform renovation, Beyond 4, and other SKUs which we believe have higher profitable growth potential here in the U.S., and are consistent with my intention to focus more resources against key markets and customers in Europe. Two, we will be rolling out Beyond 4 in U.S. retail and view this renovation as an important and potentially transformative moment for our brand and category. Iron sharpens iron, and we certainly experienced this ancient metaphor firsthand. Specifically, the current climate of misinformation and efforts by incumbents, including, sadly, pharmaceutical interests, to poison the plant-based meat well, push us to accelerate gains in the health profile of our product platforms. To be clear, as I've often repeated, likely the point of boredom of listeners, we are proud of the health benefits available through our current products, including, for example, those documented in the Swap Meat Study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, where participants experienced a meaningful drop in LDL or bad cholesterol, as well as a decline in TMAO, a compound in the gut associated with heart disease, after switching from animal-based meats to beyond meats across eight-week intervals. And we are proud of the certifications associated with our existing product lines, such as the American Heart Association's Heart Check Program certification of our Beyond Steak and Beyond Beef Crumbles. However, as we have also oft repeated, we are chasing a perfect build of meat from plants, and this goal encompasses sensory as well as nutritional characteristics. On the latter, our job is to deliver as much of the nutritional benefits of plant-based eating as we can in the familiar and satiating form and taste of meat. Over the years, we've surrounded ourselves with a broad ecosystem of doctors, registered dietitians, and leading health institutions to guide us in this effort. Combination of this extensive input and the talent and expertise of our research and development team is what led to what I believe is a significant breakthrough in the Beyond 4 platform. If you come to our facilities in Los Angeles, you will see that one of the analytical areas that we emphasize is the structure, interplay, and distribution of plant-based proteins and fats. In Beyond 4, the team was able to blend high-quality proteins from fava beans, red lentils, peas, and brown rice together with fats from avocado oil in a way that delivers superior nutrition and sensory outcomes. The nutritionals are clear and compelling, including high levels of plant-based protein, 21 grams specifically, with just two grams of saturated fat, which is 75% less saturated fat than a typical 80-20 animal beef patty. Avocado oil has been identified as potentially beneficial across a range of health outcomes, including reducing the risk of various chronic diseases, among them heart disease, as well as potentially helpful with eye and skin health, reflecting its composition of monounsaturated fats, antioxidants, and other plant compounds. The critics will undoubtedly continue to agitate. A favorite target is sodium levels, and the sleight of hand employed is to compare the Beyond Burger, which is seasoned, to an unseasoned ground beef burger. Keeping in mind that the current Beyond Burger contains 17% of the daily recommended value of sodium, which when appropriately compared to seasoned beef burgers, often means less, not more, sodium. Nevertheless, Beyond 4 achieves a 20% reduction in the amount of sodium, with the sodium content now registering at 14% of daily values. Quick math reveals that even if you were to have seven of the Beyond 4 burgers in a single day, this consumption alone would not exceed the daily recommended value of sodium. And here's the thing, we're not done. As the critics position, talk, post, and lobby, we will keep chasing our own true north, that perfect build of meat from plants, and you can expect even lower sodium levels in subsequent generations. 
These and other advances in Beyond 4 have earned recognition from important members of the health and nutrition community. This includes the American Association's Heart Check Program certification of a series of heart-healthy recipes featuring the Beyond 4 beef and burger, the placement of the American Diabetes Association seal on our Beyond 4 beef and burger packaging, as both products meet the nutritional guidelines of the American Diabetes Association's Better Choices for Life program, and the Clean Label Project certification of the Beyond 4 beef and burger. Moreover, in a survey of registered dietitians at a recent conference, 94% of these dietitians answered that they enjoyed the taste of the new Beyond Burger, viewed it as healthful, and would recommend it, while broader consumer testing scored favorably across the taste, juiciness, and texture relative to our existing burger. Three, we are implementing changes to our U.S. trade and pricing programs, effective in early Q2. Though varied across channels and product lines, we expect the overall impact of these pricing changes to meaningfully impact margin across the balance of the year. This change in strategy does not reflect an abandonment of our long-sought price parity goal, which we in fact achieved in certain very specific offerings. Rather, the change reflects three main factors. One, we clearly need to restore our margins, and this, coupled with the network consolidation I discussed momentarily, are expected to aid greatly toward this end. Two, the broad pricing programs we put in place over the last 18 months simply didn't accomplish the goal of crossing from early adopters into the mainstream. In retrospect, the noise and swirl surrounding the category reached decibels that were perhaps sufficient to drown out pricing and other messages. Three, given the aforementioned margin objectives, as well as the inclusion of certain premium ingredients in the Beyond Four platform, our pricing architecture is putting far more deliberate emphasis on tiered pricing across our product lines. Four, as referenced above, we are nearing the completion of what has been a very difficult but highly worthwhile consolidation of our production network. Though we undertook these changes for myriad reasons depending on the site and partner, we expect this right-sizing to substantially contribute to margin. To give a sense of the magnitude of this restructuring effort, it helps to consider that in the last two years, we've contracted our production network from as many as 13 co-packers in North America to just one today. This consolidation, coupled with an emphasis on internal production, has obvious benefits relating to overhead absorption, as well as logistics and quality control. Five, we are continuing to invest in our European business and related strategic customers. In a recent trip to the UK, I was struck by what I am personally certain is the future of plant-based meat, that is, a growing ubiquity. I was able to, within a radius of no more than three blocks, enjoy delicious Beyond Meat offerings at McDonald's UK, Pizza Hut UK, and Starbucks UK. More generally, I routinely enjoy watching with much interest the reaction of visitors at our headquarters in Los Angeles when they taste the McPlant Nugget, which is now available in Germany. Almost universally, it is viewed as indistinguishable from its animal protein equivalent. Similar to the delicious aforementioned products at Pizza Hut UK and Starbucks UK, this outcome reflects years of development and investment that helps separate Beyond Meat. Before moving on from Europe, I should note that across 2024, we look forward to more fulsome entry into the German retail market given our recent satisfaction of local shelf life requirements. In closing my comments, I want to properly frame the state of our business. Over the last 12 to 18 months, we spent considerable time, energy, and resources reorienting Beyond Meat's trajectory amidst changing and challenging conditions with an eye towards sustainable operations and a return to growth. To reiterate, these major steps include a potential leap forward in the value proposition of our core product lines, a steep reduction in our operating costs and cash use as we continue to implement lean management principles, the contraction of our production network to achieve quality and margin gains, and the implementation of pricing changes also in support of margin expansion. As we look forward, we expect the early results from this extensive spade work, together with specific actions we plan to pursue to bolster our balance sheet, to make 2024 an important promising year for the Beyond Meat story. With that, I'll turn it over to Luby, our Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer, 
to walk us through our fourth quarter and full year 2023 financial results in greater detail, as well as provide our outlook for 2024. Thank you, Ethan, and good afternoon, everyone. Before diving into the components of our fourth quarter P&L, let me provide some color more broadly on the significant non-cash charges you will have seen in our press release today. You'll recall we announced in November 2023 that we were initiating a review of our global operations spanning five areas. First, the potential exit of select product lines. Second, changes to our pricing architecture within certain channels. Third, accelerated cash accretive inventory reduction initiatives. Fourth, further optimization of our manufacturing capacity and real estate footprint. And lastly, fifth, a review and potential restructuring of our operations in China. We recorded 67.5 million in non-cash charges in cost of goods sold this quarter in connection with our global operations review. These charges consisted of a few different items, including the provision for certain inventory now deemed to be excess or obsolete given changes to our strategic priorities, as well as more limited internal resources following our November 2023 reduction in force. We also recorded a significant charge representing accelerated depreciation expense on certain fixed assets determined to be non-core to our strategic priorities within the foreseeable horizon, but for which no recovery or sale value could be reasonably expected. Also in connection with the Global Operations Review, we recorded a non-cash write-off to cost of goods sold associated with a prepaid option to purchase certain raw material ingredients, which we no longer expect to exercise. Within operating expenses, we recorded a non-cash charge of $17.6 million, reflecting the write-down to estimated fair value of certain production and R&D fixed assets, which we now intend to sell. Of note, $16.3 million of the non-cash items recorded in cost of goods sold and $3.6 million of the non-cash items recorded in operating expenses related to Beyond Meat Jerky, which we have made the decision as part of our global operations review to discontinue. Let me now briefly review our fourth quarter financial results before turning to our 2024 outlook. Net revenues decreased 7.8% to $73.7 million in the fourth quarter of 2023, compared to $79.9 million in the year-ago period. The decrease in net revenues was driven by a 14.6% decrease in net revenue per pound, partially offset by an 8% increase in volume of products sold. The decrease in net revenue per pound was mainly driven by changes in product sales mix and increased trade discounts, partially offset by favorable impact from foreign exchange rates. The increase in volume sold was primarily driven by sales in our international business, where we continue to see solid growth across our retail and food service channels. However, this was partially offset by softness in our U.S. business, where volumes declined in both our retail and food service channels, due mainly to continued category weakness and the lapping of certain business in our food service channel that did not repeat in Q423. Turning to gross profit and gross margin, gross profit in the fourth quarter of 2023 was a loss of $83.9 million compared to a loss of $2.9 million in the year-ago period, which included the negative impact of non-cash charges totaling $78 million taken in the fourth quarter of 2023. Of the aforementioned amount, $67.5 $67.5 million was associated with strategic decisions arising from our global operations review, and $10.5 million was due to other special items driven mainly by additional reserves for inventory associated with a large QSR customer and the write-off of a prepaid fee resulting from the termination of a co-manufacturing agreement in Q4 2023. Excluding the aforementioned charges, gross profit and gross margin were also impacted by lower net revenue per pound, partially offset by reduced logistics costs per pound compared to the year-ago period. Operating expenses were $76.9 million in the fourth quarter of 2023, compared to $62.8 million in the year-ago period. The increase in operating expenses included non-cash charges totaling $17.6 million associated with our global operations review, 
which I described a moment ago. Excluding these charges, operating expenses also reflected reduced non-production headcount expenses, lower restructuring expenses, reduced scale-up expense, and lower selling expenses, partially offset by higher consulting fees compared to the year-ago period. Moving down the P&L, total other income net of $5.7 million was lower by approximately $1.2 million compared to the year-ago period, reflecting decreased realized and unrealized foreign currency gains. Losses related to the company's joint venture with PepsiCo, the Planet Partnership, decreased by approximately $8 million year over year, reflecting the reduced scale of our jerky business versus the year-ago period. Overall, net loss in the fourth quarter of 2023 was $155.1 million, or $2.40 per common share, compared to net loss of $66.9 million, or $1.05 per common share in the year-ago period. Net loss in the fourth quarter of 2023 included non-cash charges totaling $95.6 million, as previously described. Adjusted EBITDA was a loss of $125.1 million in the fourth quarter of 2023, compared to an adjusted EBITDA loss of $56.5 million in the year-ago period. Turning now to our balance sheet, the company's cash and cash equivalents balance, including restricted cash, was $205.9 million, and total outstanding debt was $1.1 billion as of December 31, 2023. Net cash used in operating activities was $107.8 million in the year ended December 31, 2023, compared to $320.2 million in the year-ago period. Capital expenditures totaled $10.6 million in the year ended December 31, 2023, compared to $70.5 million in the year-ago period. Let me now turn to our full year 2024 outlook. We expect net revenues to be in the range of to $345 million, and net revenues for the first quarter of 2024 are expected to be in the range of approximately $70 million to $75 million. Gross margin is expected to be in the mid to high teens and is expected to be higher in the second half of the year relative to the first half, reflecting the timing of anticipated pricing actions and further production insourcing activities. Operating expenses are expected to be in the range of $170 million to $190 million, weighted slightly more towards the first half of the year. And capital expenditures are expected to be in the range of $15 million to $25 million. Finally, in 2024, we plan to bolster our liquidity and potentially restructure our balance sheet. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks and turn the call over to the operator to open it up for your questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press a star then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Andrew Strelzik with BMO. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. This is Daniel Goldon for Andrew. Hi. Hey there. When will the Beyond 4 be rolled out, and will that be a phase rollout? And is pricing going to be rolled out alongside it? And what's the magnitude of pricing you plan on taking? Um, and kind of what channels and, and geographies is that plan for? Thank you for the question. So uh, we're very excited to have the Beyond 4 come out. Um, it will be uh, it was shipping um, next month and, and probably start to gain broader distribution uh, April uh, timeframe uh, and into May, um, and that will be in, in U.S. retail. Uh, on pricing, um, there are two – Kind of separate issues, uh, you know. The, the Beyond Four, as I mentioned in my remarks, was many years in the making, um, and, and we were able to, to get it out uh, as we roll into the summer um, season this year. Uh, but it does coincide well with some pricing changes that we have to take, um, and so uh, they, they will be largely coincident 
um, and uh, and certainly it helps that there's some premium ingredients um, in uh, Beyond Four, and I think an enhanced value proposition in Beyond Four to help support that pricing. Um, in terms of the magnitude, we should probably talk with retailers first before getting into um, the specific details on that. Um, but uh, you know, the entire effort uh, is really around um, making sure that we get back to very healthy margins. Um, and we did a tremendous amount of work on this question around elasticity, uh, worked with an external firm and, and looked across our portfolio uh, at where we thought um, pricing uh, you know, had, had some headroom. Um, or room rather for for growth and um, and so I think we've made the right decisions here and just look forward to, to to rolling it out. But it is really part. If I could just reiterate some of the things that I was saying on our uh, introductory remarks, it's part of an entire effort to to really reset the business after um, you know about 12 to 18 months of effort to reorient what we're doing from uh, a much more growth at all cost focused. Um, uh, uh, operating model to one now that is highly focused on sustainability and profitability. And so the pricing increase is just one of those things. Uh, but if you look at all of the changes that we're making, whether it's a substantial reduction in, in operating uh, budget, will be down significantly from, uh, from 2023 if we execute according to our 24 plan, uh, as well as a very substantial reduction in cash use. Um, if you look at the global staff cuts we've made over the last several years, um, you know the one that we did in, in November was not insignificant at about 19%. Um, and so I think we're, we've really right-sized the business uh, to, for the size of, uh, of the current opportunity and, and the growth that we want to create ahead. Um, pricing, you know, is, is, a, is a very significant tool in restoring margin, but it's not the only one. We're also uh, well underway in terms of production efficiencies that we've been chasing. And, you know, if you think about the magnitude of the effort over the last several years to put the business into a footprint that's consistent with the current opportunities, uh, you know, we've gone from 13 manufacturing locations that are external to our company down to one. Uh, and bringing a lot of that production in-house uh, to, 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 to uh benefit from much higher overhead absorption and, and, uh, and some material flow efficiencies and things of that nature, reduce logistic costs, so on and so forth. Um, so it, it's really part and parcel with an entire effort to, to reorient the business towards sustainable and then profitable organizations. I think I mentioned in the, in the um, opening remarks that you know, we're going to be discontinuing jerky. That's the same idea there. Um, and then this last uh, uh, um, you know, global business review to, to, to take out some of the excess inventory and assets that we have uh, from a write-down perspective and then be able to, to monetize those uh, uh, with less pressure on, on us. So all these things, again, uh, we were at one size uh, and, and needed to get a little bit leaner. I think we've done that now. And so in 24, I very much look forward to uh, a lot of this coming to, to fruition and, and this reset beginning to really show. That's very really helpful. That's Thank you. Really helpful. Mm -hmm. Uh, just one more for me. Can you speak to your confidence in the gross margin guide? Sure, I'll give that to Louie, but I think the two main features that I, that I just referenced, one is the pricing change as well as this consolidation of our production network and the increased um, or continuing, rather, uh, uh, COG reductions that, that you see throughout the, the last 12 months. Um, those will, I think, help uh, significantly, um, and then also clearing out of some of the higher reserve levels we've had. Yeah, um, I, you know, that, not a whole lot to add to that, but um, you know, I think just generally in speaking to sort of our, our confidence level, um, we feel pretty good about it, right? And so, you know, we we did say in the guidance that we provided that we expect. Uh, gross margins to be higher in the back half relative to uh, the first half, and that's related to you know some of the the timing um, around some of these actions. You know, Ethan already discussed the the pricing. Um, you know, one thing that we have communicated on prior calls as well is that we are um, you know rolling back to 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 some degree right the the level of of promotions you know that we've done. You know, we really did uh, some some aggressive promotions um, in twenty. 2023 as a means of trying to uh, draw more consumers um, into the category, um, and we're taking a little bit of a different approach this year. 
Um, you know, the, the insourcing of finished goods production, you know, is something that I think, um, you know, should not be underestimated. As Ethan said, it really gives us an opportunity to, to sweat our assets more and benefit from uh, you know, the fixed the, the the fixed cost absorption. Um, you know, as well as the fact is it it, it helps us um, from a logistics cost perspective as well, right? You can imagine if you um, have eight or ten different co-manufacturers in your network, um, you know, you're, you're transporting ingredients and, you know, work and process items to multiple locations. That starts to uh, have a, you know, detrimental uh, effect on your logistics costs. And so all of these, these things combined, I think, give us, um, you know, pretty, pretty good confidence that uh, we should be able to, to achieve the, the margin targets that we're, that we're, we're seeking. The next question is from Adam Samuelson with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Yeah. Hi. So uh, I just want to, Louis Ethan, I want to just make sure I'm thinking about the 2024 outlook pieces correctly. Right. Given the revenue outlook you've given, given the gross margin outlook for kind of mid to high teens, the operating expenses, and there's a, some DNA and stock comp, so it's not all cash, but there's also the CapEx. It would still look like the cash burn based on the gross margin, less the OpEx, less the, less the, um, less the CapEx, add back some DNA and stock comp. Um, you would still have a cash burn from operations in 2024 of $100 million plus. Um, and A, am I missing something in terms of the non, non-cash expenses in there? Um, because I'm just trying to think about that level of cash burn in 2024 relative to an ending cash balance in 23 of, I think, $205 million, um, arguably kind of expecting to burn half or more of your, uh, your cash balance in 24 before further liquidity actions. Yeah, I can, I'll, I'll add to that very high level and hand it over to Luby. I, I do think we should probably, after the call, work through you, work, work through this with you on, on some of the puts and takes. Um, we're, we're pretty comfortable that, that it's going to come in at a reasonable number and, 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 and uh, you know, lower than, a, than 100, certainly at the midpoint. Um, but uh, but Luby can get guidance on that. Yeah. Um, so, Adam, I, I'm not sure, you know, what the um, what assumptions you're making in there in terms of, you know, some of the the non-cash um, addbacks. But, you know, um, I, I think the, the number that you're you're sort of uh, uh, you know th- that you referenced there, roughly 100 million. Um, you know, I think if you just uh, looked at sort of, um, you know, if you, you look at some of the big non-cash items, the depreciation and stock comp from last year, and factor that in, um, and, and then just take our guidance, you know, I, I, that, that would put us sort of right at the range that you're, you're talking about. You know, obviously, we expect to do better in, in certain areas. The other thing that's not um, baked into those numbers, right, we did – you know, part of the reason why we have these uh, significant um, uh, non-cash charges is we're writing down, you know, certain uh, fixed assets, right, to, to, to estimated fair value so that we can sell them and start to monetize some of those, those assets, doing the same thing on the inventory side. And so that should, um, you know, that, that, that should uh, provide some benefit to cash as well. Um, we, you know, we did talk about that we're looking to bolster um, our, our liquidity. So, look, we're doing everything that uh, we need to do to um, fix sort of the fundamentals of the business so that we are fundamentally a lower cash consumption business, right, um, with a longer-term goal, obviously, of getting to sustained free cash flow positive. Um, but, you know, we're, we're being responsible as well. And, uh, you know, this is why, you know, one of our objectives for 2024 is to bolster the, the, the balance sheet. But, you know, like I said, there's other puts and takes that, you know, just our guidance alone on its face would, would not necessarily uh, consider, but we think we'll provide a little bit of uh, upside relative to, to the number that you were estimating. Okay. All right. That's helpful. Let me take that offline. If I guys could follow up just on the outlook uh, for revenues, which you have down 8% to, to roughly flat year over year for, for 2024, um, 
what are volumes assumed in that at, at this juncture? I'm just trying to get a sense of how much price elasticity you really think w- would come from the higher price increases, the higher prices, particularly in, in U.S. retail. Yeah, so we don't um, we don't uh, necessarily guide to um, you know to, to volume, right? So we we gave you the the revenue dollar projection, but what I can say is we we looked at price elasticities very um, uh, deeply as part of this um, exercise, and we're looking at at our at our pricing, and it is going to vary by channel and and region, um, et cetera, but. You know, we believe and we feel pretty confident, right, that um, some, in some of the areas where we are looking to take pricing, um, that the, you know, elasticity, um, you know, w- w- the, the changes in price will offset, will more than offset the, um, you know, anticipated uh, loss of volume as a result of the price increase. And so I, I don't want to get too, specifics, uh, too specific on, on volume numbers, but, um, you know, generally speaking, right, we, we would expect the elasticity to be less than one. Okay, so just to be clear there, um, if you're still having revenue dollars down, if the, but the price increase is offsetting the volume declines, is the revenue declines, the dollar declines a function of exiting product lines or regions or what then would be drive, what would be underpinning the revenue dollar decline expectation? Yeah, so some of it, like, so there is some um, exit of product lines. You know, we talked about jerky um, as an example. Uh, the, the other thing is, you know, the reality is our U.S. retail business, right, continues to be challenged, and so there is some assumption in there um, which, you know, we hope will turn out to be conservative, but nonetheless, you know, we've seen uh, baseline um, velocity erosion in U.S. retail channel, um, and so we're trying to factor that in, um, you know, particularly on the downside. Um, so, you know, th- those are sort of the uh, the – the, the key drivers, I guess, um, when you look at the lower end of the range. I think that's right. The um, the continued kind of um, vulnerability in, in U.S. retail uh, is something that just as you do your models, as we do our models, right, we didn't want to have too rosy a picture around. I think the, the general notion here is that we're, we're doing a, a massive product launch that's, a, you know, I think transformative in terms of what we've done over the last Eight years is probably the most important renovation we've done uh, since the Beyond Burger, and um, and then we're also taking price. So the two of those uh, make it very hard to to predict with a ton of certainty any type of, of growth. We just don't know. So we wanted to come in with something that was uh, reflected kind of current information and hope to change it and have a better outcome. Okay, I appreciate all that color. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Mm-hmm. The next question is from John Baumgartner with Mizuho. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thanks for the question. Sure. Um, Why don't I stick with with the guidance for next year and specifically the the OPEX? Um, I mean, the midpoint you're guiding to, it's about like a 25% drop from, you know, your recent sort of run rates. Um, The global force reduction announced last quarter, I guess, explains a small part of it. But I'm trying to understand the rest of that decline, especially in the context of what I guess seems to be more reinvestment in marketing and brand building at this point. So I think I've said this before, but, you know, one of the things I like to say about marketing is that, you know, marketing is a lot easier when it's true. And uh, what it really gets to is, you know, you've got to have a great product. Um, and I think Edwin Land said it in an even more pointed way, which was uh, marketing is what you do when your product's no good. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, what we have to do, right, is re-engage the consumer uh, into this entire category with products that are really delivering value to them in a way that they understand. And so for us, that's you know, really about continuing to improve the taste, which I think we've done with Beyond 4, but also addressing this fundamental issue around health. You know, as I said in my prepared remarks, you know, we, we really do have a set of products that today can deliver fantastic health outcomes. Uh, and I've seen it in my own life, in my family's. I've seen it in you know, studies we've done with Stanford, which I won't belabor today, um, and, uh, and others. But um, what we wanted to do was take it another level. 
and we wanted to continue this march toward that perfect build. And I think we, we've taken a really big step here. It is not just an iteration. It's, it's something that's more transformative than that. And so to be able to have these products where you're enjoying the satiating experience, having a burger or having a bolognese or, or whatever you decide to do with it, um, and yet having a, an oil that, that um, for example, many in the nutrition community and medical community would characterize as heart healthy, uh, is something that, that is new. And it's, it's something that changes the dynamic of the decision. Uh, you know, this went from five grams to two grams of saturated fat. And it's not just the composition of, uh, sorry, it's not just the, the level of, of uh, the, the fat in our product. It's the fact that it now comes from a source that I think is very well identified as delivering benefits, not just because of the low levels, but because of what's in it. So this is things like polyphenols, antioxidants, and other plant compounds that, you know, depending on what study you want to look up, uh, you know, people have attributed to, you know, being helpful in the area of cardiovascular disease or, or dementia or, uh, you know, uh, the health of your eyes or skin, whatever it is. There's a lot of benefit here. We've also been able to reduce the sodium, uh, which, as I said before, is a red herring, but it's still there uh, and, and something we have to uh, address. And so at 14% of daily value now, you know, that's a significant improvement. Uh, and then you look at the proteins, you know, whether we're, we're using you know, not just uh, pea protein, but by going with red lentils and fava beans and brown rice, we've increased the protein amount. So you have a product that fundamentally delivers a stronger value proposition. And you're know, certainly going to market around that, but there's also a word of mouth in this community, and there's a strong desire, uh, whether it's the health community or the environment community or the animal welfare community, for these products in this category to come back. And so I think we're going to leverage that, uh, and you'll see us work, you know, a lot with registered dietitians and, and nutritionists and the medical community, um, as well as with these very large health organizations that I mentioned, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association. In fact, the American Diabetes um, seal uh, will be on the package itself, uh, Clean Label Project and, and others. So, um, you know, we're going to have to market for sure. But we're also going to do it in a way that, look, this is a fundamental shift in the value proposition. It's enhanced, it's increased, and uh, I think people will begin to realize that. So this use of grassroots marketing, this use of um, institutions that are standing behind this, I think will allow us to do it much more efficiently. And so some of the costs that we've cut out of the business, um, you know, I think only help us to become profitable more quickly versus hurt us uh, from, a, from a marketing perspective. Okay. Right I don't know. No, I think you covered it. Okay, then to follow up on the, the gross margin guidance for 2024, um, the improvement there, uh, how much does that rest on the price increases? I mean, I, I guess it sounds as though you're not building in much operating leverage from new volume growth. The coal man consolidation, I think, has been accruing sort of quietly all along. And then with the China anti-dumping duties and the pea protein, I imagine input costs can't be all that beneficial this year. So it feels like the gross margin expansion in the guide a fair amount of it just boils down to the price increases. Is, is, that, is that right? I guess can you walk through the kind of the, the, the relative contribution, the magnitude there for the drivers? So I think, you know, you, you hear me talk a lot about um, how proud I am of the research development team here. Um, and uh, I often uh, spend more time on it than I do on the operations team. And one of the things that I've, I have felt hasn't been fair, not fair, but just has been unfortunate, is that you know they're doing a really good job driving our fundamental cost structure down, right? Whether it's our facilities in Pennsylvania or Missouri, I mean these are great operators that are really driving uh, efficiency. And every quarter we have something that comes up, you know whether it's we're dislocating from one co-packer and there's some fees or um, you know some high reserves coming in from legacy products or partnerships that have kind of disrupted that, right, and have not allowed them to shine publicly, although I see what they're doing. Um, and so as we steady and kind of bring in uh, the production network, I think some of those savings that we're uh, achieving uh, in our facilities will start to come through a little bit better. And uh, an example of that is just the, you know, as we're taking production out of external networks and into internal the utilization rates uh, in our facilities are significantly improving over at absorption, significantly improving. So these are things that I think, even though we're going to be using, for example, in Beyond 4, some more premium ingredients, they kind of are offset and then even driven uh, down somewhat 
uh, over time by by the uh, the internalization of our production and and the continued uh, reduction in um, in uh, in uh, uh, overall cost. So for the guys who are listening and the gals who are listening, appreciate it. And uh, you know, you guys got to keep it up. We're finally going to be able to show it. Yeah, I would just add. You know, um, I think it's fair to say that um, you know the that some the price increases are a significant uh, factor that play into the gross margin expansion that we're targeting um, for for next year. But it's not just that, you know, um, as Ethan mentioned, right, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on, um, you know, just across the, uh, you know, the production, our operations, um, organization, et cetera. Um, you know, the other thing in addition to just, you know, price increases, we talked about pulling back on trade. So the combined, you know, impact of those two things, right, actually has a pretty potentially meaningful impact on, on overall net revenue per pound. And then, you know, you mentioned the um, internalization, right, the increased in sourcing of our, in, in, uh, of our finished good production, um, you know, and you mentioned that, you know, some of that has pretty much been accruing already. You know, I think that's true, but there still was a lot of noise in our uh, cost of goods um, in 2023, you know, even as we were internalizing, we're still dealing with, um, you know, things like underutilization fees and things like that. And I think, you know, that type of stuff should be significantly reduced in 2024. And so now I think we, you know, we are in a position where we start to benefit in a much more meaningful way from bringing um, a lot of those production volumes in-house. And then I mentioned a little bit earlier that, you know, there should be benefits as well from, you know, just a more streamlined network overall from in terms of logistics costs. When you look at some of these initiatives that we're, we're targeting now to, um, you know, reduce overall inventory balances, that benefits, you know, warehousing costs and things like that. You know, even the, you know, reclassification of some of, you know, these fixed assets to held for sale, right, um, will have a beneficial impact from a depreciation perspective, right? And so, you know, you combine all of these things together and, and um, you know, that, that makes us feel pretty optimistic about um, where uh, gross margins can go this year. Okay. Thanks, Luby. Thank you, Ethan. Sure. The next question is from Robert Moscow with C.D. Cowan. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, Ethan and Luby, uh, it looks like the, the center of gravity is going to continue to shift to international markets for your business. Um, it, it, can you speak to the profit margin profile of operating internationally? How is it different from domestic? Um, can, can you operate at, at, a, at a respectable margin uh, overseas, or are there complicating factors that make it more difficult than here? Thanks, Rob. Good, good to hear from you. Um, so, uh, you know, when we think international, uh, obviously, I've, I've said a lot about Europe in the past, and in some sense, um, you know, that's becoming <clears throat> kind of its own um, operation over there. So, it's not necessarily like we're shipping things from here or, or anything of that nature. They're driving a lot of the same cost reductions. We have a terrific partner there uh, who, uh, who does some of our production. Is really a, a true partner to us, um, as well as a, a, a very good general manager there and team. So, I think you know I I, uh, I don't foresee that being particularly challenged uh, from a cost perspective. Now, um, we're still pretty nascent there, and so we do have to continue to adjust downward the cost structure. But that's possible, and uh, it's something that we'll we'll, we'll continue to focus on because some of our retail pricing, for example, is just too high. Uh, for those markets, and so we need to, to continue to adjust it. But that comes with time and further localization of our of our network, which is is doable. Uh, we just need to the time to do it. Um, and then on the you know kind of food service side, uh, we'll continue to drive cost out of out of those products and improve margin. Uh, and I think you'll start to see that come through uh, in, uh, in 24. But be- mm-hmm. yeah, not, not a lot I would add to that, um, Rob. You know, but I think fundamentally, if you look at our international business uh, relative to U.S., it does skew more towards uh, food service. And, you know, we have, um, we've built a pretty meaningful business now with, 
you know, some of the large, um, you know, QSR customers in, international. And so, you know, as you can imagine, the, uh, the, the margin profile for that business would look somewhat different for, uh, than on the retail side. But, you know, I guess the, the short answer to your question about, you know, um, do we, you know, have respectable margins in, in international? I would say yes, right? Um, but as Ethan mentioned, there is still... Um, you know, a number of things and initiatives that we're pursuing to, um, you know, to, to bring about even further improvement in margin in the international business. And it is striking, as you, and that is not directly responsive, but I'll just use it as an opportunity. It is, it is striking to see the difference there uh, in terms of uptake uh, of the category and products. The thing I mentioned, um, you know, in, in my prepared remarks is, is significant that, you know, within a several block radius in London, uh, you know, you're going to uh, McDonald's, uh, getting Beyond Burger. You're going to uh, Starbucks, getting a, a Beyond Sausage, uh, Pizza, and getting uh, you know Beyond Pepperoni. And it, it's um, it's you know these trends tend to to be stronger in Europe and then come over here. And and, uh, and that's certainly our hope that we'll get through the politicalization of of, 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 of these protein choices here in the U.S. and just get back to hey, let's do something that's good for our health, good for the environment. Well, Ethan, I'm very impressed that you're you're going to McDonald's and and Burger King in London when you visit there. So uh, keep up the good uh, fight. Um, but uh, I, I yeah, I, but I you you also mentioned that pricing is too high uh, for some of your products in the market. I think you've said that before. Can it be yeah. more specific as to why that is? Is it is it more commoditized uh, the category in Europe or or how, how do I think about that? Yeah. It, no, it, I'll, I'll maybe give the details on it, but it's, it's, I was talking about retail, and um, it just, it, it, we're still, uh, you know, think about Beyond Meat in 2009 here in the United States, like we're, we're still kind of getting going there in terms of the overall uh, production process and things of that nature, but clearly further along um, than we were at that point. But Libby can give some, some uh, detail. Yeah, Rob, you know, I think... Um one of the differences um, when you look at the retail landscape in the EU versus the, the U.S. is they have a much larger uh, private label uh, 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 presence, right? And so I think the, the penetration of private label in the EU is about double, um, you know, here in the U.S. And so there, there, are, there, are, um, there is a much broader, I guess, portfolio of, of items that compete in our category that at a much lower price. And, um, you know, the, the consumer in the EU does seem to be, um, you know, a little bit more predisposed towards private label than maybe the, the average U.S. consumer. Um, we, two years ago, um, you know, took some steps to close the, um, the price gap of our products relative to the broader competitive set um, in the EU. But, you know, certainly certain product categories where we still remain um, at a pretty healthy premium. And I think over time, the, the goal would still be to try to um, compress that gap somewhat. No, you know, not necessarily, uh, you know, I don't know that there's a need to come down to the level of, of private label in the region, for example, but there are areas where we think that the price gap is still um, to, uh, wider than, than where it needs to be. But that's something that will occur over time. You know, I don't, I don't think um, it's something that we're immediately looking to, um, you know, to address. And so... Um, that's uh, you know, that, that, that's just some some general uh, fundamental differences I think between the the trade in, in the EU versus the the US. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Rob. Sure, thanks, Rob. The next question is from Alexia Howard with Bernstein. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Alexia. Um, so, so can we just get back to uh, the dynamic in in the US and how? How do you go about re-recruiting lapsed consumers? Um, if people were somehow disappointed in previous products, what compels them back into this, um, especially if the price gaps to animal meat products are expanding because of the price increases you're planning to take? Um, and then specifically, I guess, linked to that, is marketing spend expected to be up or down in 2024? I think on the, the question of bringing people back into the category, um, the biggest deterrent uh, 
has been this health question, right? And you know, you, you've heard me talk about it before that that there's a, you know, um, it's not um, without uh, impetus and and, uh, and support from the company industry, uh, and that that needs to really be looked at as well. I mean, it is it's not just the animal protein players and, and their lobbyists, but it's actually the pharmaceutical uh, part, members of the pharmaceutical industry, which I, I find to be um, kind of disturbing, actually. Um, and so we had to write the, the message, and, and, you know, we could do that by you know, yelling from the, the rooftop about the benefits of our existing products, or we can just try to make them even more uh, uh, healthier and unassailable at some point. So that's what we've done, uh, I think, with, with Beyond Forward. We'll continue to do it. You can expect future iterations to continue to drive improvements. Um, and then it's just linking up with uh, associations and, and national institutions that, that um, really can uh, validate uh, what we're talking about. And they help develop these products. That's the fascinating part about this work is that we didn't just do this uh, you know, with, with, uh, in a conference room on our own. We were out in the community talking to doctors and nutritionists and, and each of these institutions. Uh, our head of communications did an amazing job um, pulling together an ecosystem of, of doctors and, and nutritionists and, and, and different national health organizations as well as universities, and we listened, uh, and we worked very closely with them. And I can go back to individual conversations with individual doctors uh, that relate to specific inputs that we used. Um, and so I do think that there's an opportunity here for a more organic style of marketing um, that relies on the power of social media. Uh, that relies on the fundamental truth of the products uh, to bring people back in. And this wasn't just a health upgrade. Um, this was something that, that for years we've been focusing on creating much more of a neutral beef taste. Um, you know, as I've mentioned many times, there's over 4,000 molecules that make meat uh, taste like meat. And our, our job is to use the scientific expertise we have here to match those with uh, analogous or the same uh, molecules in plants, and then find out what the main drivers are and incorporate this into our products. And I think the team has done an amazing job with this product doing that. So you get a benefit in health, you get a benefit in taste, and you get the word out. And, you know, we've been very successful uh, over the last decade in using people in a position of influence within society uh, to carry that message uh, because uh, they believe in it. And when the message is this powerful, when you have the opportunity to help people really improve their cardiovascular health, to really uh, improve uh, the, the risk uh, outcomes that they face in their day-to-day -day life from a health perspective, uh, there are folks in a position of uh, influence that want to talk about that. And so you're going to see us go back to that playbook in a very big way uh, to get this message out. And you know, whether it's ambassadors or influencers, uh, whether it's some of the institutions, um, when you're trying to do something that's good and people recognize it and there's a lot of truth to it, uh, you, you tend to get help. And I think. Uh, we're going to get a little help from our friends on this one. And when will it be out on the shelf? Is it a national launch uh, in the first half of the year? Well, if that's a personal question, I can send you some. <laughs> okay, it's kind of. I guess, you know, I mean, if it really is that big of a leap forward. Um, and just coming back to the marketing spend, um, um, is, is that going to be up or down this year overall? Just And then I'll pass it on. Okay. Yeah, Alexia, we, we do expect in aggregate um, our marketing spend uh, to be down. As you can imagine, if you look at, you know, our guidance, our OPEX guidance and, you know, the what that implies in terms of a year-over-year -year decline, we, you know, we are taking pretty broad cuts, um, you know, across the organization. Um, but I think, you know, when you start to uh, – dig down um, into specific uh, areas of the business, specific departments, um, you know, what, what really matters is, you know, how that uh, spend is going to be directed. And, you know, so Ethan, um, you know, touched on this, but, you know, it, it's, it's really the mix um, of the marketing spend and, you know, really taking a targeted approach, being very deliberate, um, you know, about where we want to spend those marketing dollars. And so in aggregate, um, yes, it will be Lower, but um, just one comment on pricing. Uh, you know, that you're right that in certain areas there will be a, a you know more of a delta uh, between animal protein and ourselves, but in others there will not be. Um, and so this is not a kind of you know um, crude application of a price increase. Um, you know, we have some very important partnerships and, and relationships uh, where um, you know 
depending on the product line, uh, there won't be much change. Um, and so, and, and including in retail, there, there you'll see some products where there's really not, not that much change. But in the aggregate, uh, based on the elasticity studies we did, we'll get a nice bump in terms of margin uh, uh, while still offering the consumer you know, uh, value uh, for those that want it. Great. Thank you very much. I'll pass it on. Sure. The next question is from Peter Sale with BTIG. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, sounds like you guys have done a lot of work on pricing and the level of pricing. It sounds like it's a pretty meaningful change in your strategy. So <clears throat> I'm just curious, is, is this, are, are you thinking about this as a one-time price hike to kind of get you in, in, in order here? Uh, or is this just a real meaningful change in strategy where you're thinking, you know, this will be a hike this year or maybe two hikes this year and, and, you know, more price hikes as we go forward? Just trying to understand how this strategy is really evolving on pricing. And then can you just elaborate a little bit on your tiered pricing comments? Is this tiered by, by distribution channel, by product? Um, are some prices coming down or are all prices going up? Just trying to understand those comments. Thanks. Sure. I, yeah, I don't think it's a, a change in the long-term strategy. I mean, if you if you think about, and this is something that I find endlessly fascinating, but won't, won't dive into too much here, but you just the incredible efficiency you have when you take a set of amino acids from plants versus, you know, waiting for the uh, animal to, to process and develop them, and bacteria and turn nitrogen into protein, all that stuff. You know, it's just more efficient. Uh, and so there will be a day when, you know, this dramatically underprices animal protein, but that's not today. Uh, we did achieve price parity with certain products in certain markets uh, recently, um, but uh, yeah, in my view, uh, and that was not a, a certainly a global statement at all in terms of the products. Like we, we still have a big delta for most of our products. Um, but I will say that the pricing measures we took, I don't know they made that much difference. You know, I think um, there was so much noise in the category uh, so much noise about the category, so much um, agitation outside the category with, you know, people saying negative things about the category, scaring consumers away, that pricing just wasn't that as effective a tool. Um, and my view is we probably ended up selling uh, a lot of our products to the same consumer at a, at a reduced price. So, so um, we learned that uh, and, and moved away from it. But I do think there's a real opportunity uh, to continue to offer, you know, outstanding innovation um, year after year, uh, that does have a more premium price on it, uh, while you continue to offer some of the rest of your portfolio at lower price. Um, and so I do think you'll see that from us. And so when we talk about tiered, part of that is, is that type of dynamic. I think the other is with particular customers and channels. You know, if you think about very large strategic customers uh, that are selling, you know, uh, uh, let's say billions of burgers a day, um, you know, uh, that type of customer price sensitivity is so important, and, um, and, and, uh, and so uh, we'll continue to drive those type of products to, to parity as quickly as we can. Um, I hope that helps. Yeah, I know that's very helpful. Um, and then just lastly, on my end, um, given all the changes you guys are making, do you expect this to have a material impact on the number of doors that you're in in 2024? Yeah, I, I, I think it's too early to tell. And I meant to say it's billion served, not per day. Um, I, uh, um, I think it's just too early. Yeah, too early to tell. Yeah, I mean, um, but Peter, the one thing uh, that I'd call out in terms of uh, distribution outlets is, you know, we are, uh, we, we said we are discontinuing the jerky product. And um, as you know, there were, um, you know, there was a pretty significant uh, distribution presence related to that product. You know, it, it got us into certain channels like convenience, for example, where, you know, you look at the, the rest of our portfolio, it doesn't really play there. And so, you know, certainly on the U.S. retail side, um, you know, if you include, right, the impact of jerky, that the, those numbers should come down. But you know, out, uh, apart from that, I think we're pretty well distributed across U.S. retail, so I wouldn't expect too much movement in, in those numbers. Um, I think we would expect over time to continue to grow our presence across um, U.S. food service. 
And then it still feels like pretty early days for us in international, um, quite honestly. And so I think there's, there's room for further um, distribution expansion um, in, in international markets um, in the EU and, and other areas. Um, and, you know, even same on the international food service side. Great. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. The next question is from Ben Thurer with Barclays. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, and um, I'll keep it short. Uh, so thanks for thanks for squeezing me in. Sure. To follow up a little bit on 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 some of the dynamics in food service and kind of the success international versus uh, the declining trends in the U.S. And also wanted to bring this back to some of the partnerships over the years you've laid out with Yum Brands, with McDonald's, and so on. So I know Ethan, uh, you've talked a lot about the the McDonald's uh, case over in uh, in the U.K. Um, but what are you seeing, particularly with those food? food service players in the U.S. as it relates to your products and the rollout of those. Uh, that, that Any color you can share on that, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, I, I, as, as a, thank you very much for the question. That's a fair one. Um, you know, as I've done in the past, I really need to, to let those partners, you know, comment on, on their view on, on the category uh, uh, versus, you know, we're, we're just a supplier to them. Uh, so I, I want to be careful on that front. Um, I think that they look to the type of success we're having in, in Europe uh, and then make decisions based on what they're going to bring here. But I will say the climate here has been so, um, I used the word politicized earlier, um, and clouded uh, uh, you know, with, with this misinformation and things of that nature that we really have to straighten that out first um, from a you know, get the right information out there, make sure the consumer understands the value proposition. Um, and uh, I think the rest will follow from there. I mean, if, if I could, just on this before uh, that we're rolling out, um, you know, what we're trying to do here is create a question uh, in the consumer's mind as to why wouldn't you do this, right? And, of course, if it's too pricey, that's an answer, uh, but we don't think it will be prohibitive in its pricing. Um, and the health benefits are so clearly there, the support from uh, the medical and nutrition community is there, um, and, uh, and, you know, the taste is there. So, um, and obviously environmental benefits, and, and, and you know, I will answer your question, but the, the ability to, to solve the main issue that people are laying their hands about with climate through a change in how we get protein to the center of the plate is absolutely phenomenal. And if you talk to people who study these issues, whether it's the gentleman at Yale that's in the video we did for Beyond Four, uh, or folks at NYU, Matthew Hayek is one of them, who study this and the use of land and, and, uh, and biomass to bring carbon back out of the atmosphere uh, and cool our climate and to reduce uh, methane emissions associated with livestock, et cetera, so on and so forth, it's an incredible opportunity. And so we're going to make sure the consumers understand that, that when we're talking about healing their body and helping them to, to achieve better health outcomes, uh, we're also uh, able to do that on, on the planetary side. And at some point, it becomes such a powerful value proposition that the consumer does come back in. We need to take it away from the politics. We need to take it away from us versus them. You know, farmers should be very much involved in this and, and, uh, and making a great living doing it, not only growing our crops, but potentially receiving funds from the government to, to, uh, to sequester carbon. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a real path forward uh, for our country and, and for the globe. So I think we just have to get people excited about that concept again, uh, and the rest of the industry will follow uh, in terms of you know, restaurants and things of that nature. But you know, it's for us to apply a lot of focus on that this year is probably not the right area. So let's continue to be successful with them in Europe, and let's see what unfolds here in the U.S. in the future. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Ethan Brown for any closing remarks. Great. Thank you. Um, I would encourage folks to, to visit, put it in the press release uh, with the video that we put together around uh, Beyond Four, uh, again, to get a sense of the health benefits and to get a sense of the global environmental benefits. Um, both of them are very strong. I think both will bring uh, the consumer back to this discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, tasting is believing. We're trying by uh, type, um, type brand. Uh, and as folks taste this new iteration, I think uh, they'll be um, 
they'll be quite pleased with it. So, you know, we're cautious uh, in our optimism. Uh, we've obviously had some tough years, but um, but uh, by making these changes and, and, and creating the sustainable baseline from which we can grow, uh, we're going to create some room for, for ourselves to, to execute and, and uh, get back on track for growth. Thanks, everybody. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.